Uh, thanks a lot for having me tonight here. Uh, so I'm Sebastian. I'm with um, DeepMind um, based in London. And um, today I'm going to try to give you a broad overview of some um, cutting edge uh, uh, topics and different areas in the broader area of cross-lingual transfer learning. Um, so I generally find it useful to motivate um, transfer learning and cross-lingual transfer learning um, kind of within the context of broader transfer learning in natural language processing. Um, and in particular, transfer learning is useful when tasks such as in natural language processing share um, commonalities. Um, so for instance, if they rely on similar representations or have some structural similarities. Um, and in the case of learning across languages, um, the similarities that languages share are probably obvious to most of you um, in that many languages um, share different words, sim have similar stems, for instance. Uh, languages have similar word orders or uh, have also similarities in meaning. And all of these things we can exploit using uh, machine learning and cross-lingual learning. Um, now, transfer learning is also very useful when annotated data is rare which is very much the case for many of the world's languages where we simply do not have enough speakers or um, just enough uh, capacity in general to be able to um, annotate data for all of the world's languages. And transfer learning really allows us to make use of as much supervision as possible and leverage that to the best possible performance. Um, now, I'm just gonna summarize quickly um, and as most of you who might have been following the progress of natural language processing in recent years might be aware is that transfer learning has contributed actually to um, state of the art performance on most tasks in natural language. And to cherry pick just one uh, example out of a vast array uh, of um, state of the art performance here, um, you can see here a plot of the performance on kind of a standard core task in natural language processing um, named NT recognition, which is really about determining whether a, uh, a word in a text refers to a real world entity. Um, and as you can hear, besides many different trends, I mainly just want to highlight two in that the progress on this task um, kind of in early years since it started was mainly due to better representations on the word level. Um, and in the last two years, we've seen most of the recent um, improvements due to uh, deeper or contextual representations. And very much the same trend is true for the uh, cross-lingual learning landscape as well, in that uh, a lot of researchers early on worked on um, learning kind of jointly representations on the word level. Um, and lately, over the last year, we've seen a lot of exciting developments in uh, learning uh, multilingual contextual representations, which is mainly what I'm going to be talking about today in this talk. Um, and just to contextualize um, cross-lingual learning a bit more in um, the wider area of transfer learning, um, I found it useful to divide transfer learning within um, along a couple of axes. Um, and in particular, we can differentiate um, some of the most commonly used settings within transfer learning in current NLP um, based on whether approaches um, apply um, or deal with the same task between the source and the target setting. So typically in transfer learning, you have some setting where you have a lot of data, um, where you try to learn and extract some useful information, and then you try to apply that to your target setting. And if you're dealing with the same task, people typically differentiate whether um, the domains between your source and your target setting are different, in which case um, there's been a, uh, is a large area of domain adaptation that people have been working on. Or in our case, which is mainly what I'm going to be talking about today, where we have different languages uh, in the source and the target setting. So typically in the source setting, we have a language where we have a lot of uh, available data for, and in the target setting, a language where there's either little or no, um, no labels at all. Um, and similarly, there's a couple of other, um, two other um, related areas which um, deal with different tasks um, and which can be differentiated whether we have available um, the data for all of those tasks at the same time, in which case we typically talk about multitask learning or whether we have uh, learned these tasks eventually, in which case people typically have a, um, a surrogate task where uh, with a large amount of data, such as in mass language modeling, uh, and then you apply um, the knowledge you've gathered from that task doing uh, fine tuning. Um, but today I'm mainly going to be focus focusing about on uh, cross-linked learning here. Um, 
And another useful way or um, another very useful way in order to motivate cross-link learning, I think, is from a societal perspective. So as most of you who are probably very familiar with the internet might be aware of, is that um, actually the language you speak really um, shapes very much your experience online and particularly determines uh, to what resources you have access to. So if you're, if you're able to speak English or another language which has a lot of a large web presence, um, you're able to have access to a wide amount of information. You, uh, you can have um, a wide array of educational resources at your fingertips and you're also able to make um, a lot of human connections online. Um, however, if you speak a language um, or if your main language is one that is not very well represented online, all of these um, resources are not available to you. Um, and similarly, um, kind of going forward as machine learning and natural language processing permeate more and more um, society, um, they also really affect what uh, experiences you can make and what capabilities or how easy it is to do this, certain things. And just to highlight one particular example out of um, probably a large number that uh, come to mind if you're in a large city such as New York here and you're searching for restaurants to go for dinner one even evening, um, maybe not, not that much these days, but in a case where lockdowns lifted uh, in different countries, um, if you do the, this query in English, you get presented with a number of different options. Um, if you do the same query in another hybrid language, you similarly um, get a number of options. Uh, but now if you ask um, the application uh, in a low resource low language such as Basque, um, you are not presented with any options at all. And I think this, yeah, with this particular example, I just uh, want to highlight this general issue of um, biases in our applications, which is very much a um, a topic that is um, top of mind for many practitioners in uh, machine learning. And I think very much an underappreciated aspect in that regard is really the bias um, against low risk languages or languages which are simply not, um, not well represented online. And I hope that with the talk today also, I'm, I can raise a bit more awareness and hopefully get um, excited a bit more about working in this direction. Um, and so broadly, the solution or the approach I'm going to be trying to advocate for here is based on learning cross-link representations. So if you're familiar or if you have worked on NLP before um, kind of the era of deep learning, uh, you might be familiar with um, having language-specific models or actually computing language-specific features or doing language-specific preprocessing. Um, and at the moment, very much the, the paradigm um, that has most, mostly replaced um, these language specific approaches. Um, it's very much based on learning um, kind of general purpose representations or embeddings um, that are shared or that have a, a joint multilingual space. Um, and then applying um, kind of the, this general transfer learning formula that I briefly touched upon before to it. So what do I mean here by this transfer learning formula? Um, in this case, I really mean um, kind of the general paradigm that has driven a lot of um, recent progress in natural language processing, um, which is really about having um, access to large amounts of unlabeled data um, and to come together with your uh, representation learning method of choice, whether on the word level or the sentence level, um, and then coupling that with a second step of uh, task specific fine tuning. So, fine tuning on small amounts of labeled data in your target task. And this is really what um, most of or a lot of uh, current approaches in NLP really are doing in practice. Um, and in the cross lingual setting, the, the general recipe looks very similar with just one slight modification. Um, in particular, here now we also try to learn representations. Um, now, in this case, we try to learn multilingual representations that. Um, put in the embedding space uh, words or sentences that have um, that have the same meaning in different languages um, as close as possible together. Um, so as you can see here on kind of a schematic representation of a word level embedding space. 
Um, and then in the second step, we would now fine tune this model that has hopefully learned some um, multilingual knowledge or some knowledge that can generalize across different languages on data, um, typically of high resource language in our task of interest. In this case, this is um, natural language inference. We try to infer a relation between a pair of sentences. Um, and in, in, typically we keep the cross-lingual parameters in this case um, fixed in order to make sure that the model um, doesn't divert from what it has already learned. Um, and um, the last step then, um, and what we actually want in the end is generalization to another language where we don't have any trained data on. And typically in practice, we've observed with these models that given if they've learned um, kind of reasonably well these multilingual representations, they're actually able to transfer um, unexpectedly well to a low resource language where they actually haven't seen any label data in that language. Um, and these representations can be learned, as I mentioned before, on the word level or the sentence level. And throughout this talk, I'm mainly going to be talking about um, the latter, um, about sentence level or contextual representations. Um, and in particular, however, these, these methods really build a lot and kind of take inspiration from the lessons um, learned from their word level counterparts. So if you're interested in learning more about kind of the, the predecessor of those methods, um, you can look at a, um, like a survey in the Journal of Artificial Intelligence Research or a tutorial that we did at ACL last year, which gives kind of a general overview of this area, which is still very active um, as well these days. Um, right, and so this brings me to, to the actual uh, meat of the talk. We're um, going to be talking about um, kind of four areas within the overall landscape of cross link transfer learning, which I think are very exciting or I think there's um, a lot of interesting research going on. And in particular, in the beginning, I'm just going to briefly touch on and I'm going to look a bit more critically at why we should actually care or why we should actually do unsupervised um, cross link learning in the first place. Um, I'm then going to talk about what um, makes uh, these current cross lingual methods actually work in practice, or at least to the extent that um, researchers know at the moment. Um, I'm then going to talk about something that has been referred to as the curse of multilinguality. Uh, and finally, I'm going to talk about some issues or um, kind of new approaches for evaluating these methods. Um, so with, with regard to the first topic here, um, and this is based on some recent work that we are presenting at ACL, um, most of the approaches um, that try to learn these cross lingual representations um, generally do so without much supervision in the target language. And typically, um, these approaches motivate um, kind of this lack of supervision. Why do they try to do this in a completely unsupervised way? Um, based on two factors. Um, they first cite that, in general, um, for low resource languages, there is a lack of parallel data. Um, so kind of a lack of data that gives you some alignment, either on the word or the sentence level, between the low resource language and your high resource language. Um, and they also say that at the same time, however, um, even though we have zero parallel data, we have still access to enough monolingual data for those low resource languages to learn um, high quality uh, monolingual or representations in the first place. Um, and right now, I just want to take briefly a closer look whether those two factors are actually uh, met in the real world. Um, and in particular, if we examine those two conditions a bit more critically, um, we can actually find that both of those are not really um, met in practice. Um, on the first part, um, there are actually a fair number of um, quite large scale resources that even cover low resource languages. So for instance, there's been the JW300 parallel corpus, which has been created from um, data from religious societies, but which still covers um, a lot of very diverse topics and which covers more than um, 300 languages um, with quite a bit of parallel data between all of those. Um, secondly, something that covers even more languages, but is arguably a bit more relig uh, religious, is the multilingual Bible, but which can nevertheless be learned or uh, can nevertheless be used to get some supervision practice. Um, and even going beyond that, we have um, perhaps cheaper supervision that is just on the word level. So we have for most of the languages in the world, in fact, um, translation dictionaries that 
for a small number of uh, verb um, words or lexemes in one language um, gives us the corresponding translations in the other language. Um, so in general, there's actually um, no, or at least not for the obvious reason, uh, there's no obvious reason not to use those um, resources in practice for uh, just augmenting um, our approaches. Um, secondly, in terms of um, monolingual data, generally, um, I think there's with um, a lot of work in current representation learning, there's really the assumption that we have enough monolingual data to learn useful representations or to train even like GPT-2, GPT-3 type, uh, type models. Um, however, that is only the case for a comparatively small number of languages. Um, so even Wikipedia, where we generally assume there's provides enough supervision or covers most of the world's languages, even Wikipedia only provides for about half of the languages covered um, more than 10,000 articles, which are still not actually that much for uh, learning useful representations. Um, and even if we look beyond Wikipedia to the web, um, we also find limited presence um, of languages that covers only a few hundred languages. Um, so even uh, using web scale data doesn't actually um, solve the problem of trying to generalize um, to uh, the long tail of languages in the world. Um, and finally, there's kind of the um, opportunity, what I think, um, to use data from speech that could perhaps be uh, crowdsourced because for many languages, we do have um, millions or, um, or a large number of speakers, um, but little presence online. So generally, um, perhaps getting speech data might be more accessible. Um, however, this is very much a direction that has not been um, explored that much to date in current research, uh, uh, research in the natural language processing community. Um, now for kind of based on these uh, above reasons, um, we think that um, doing unsupervised learning actually because of those two reasons is not very realistic in practice. Um, and generally, if you just care about getting um, good performance on your target language, um, you might actually be better off doing semi-supervised learning, so uh, using some of the available supervision um, that you have access to. Um, however, um, uh, unsupervised cross-link learning is still um, useful, but for different reasons. And the main um, reasons I think people should um, still continue working on this very much um, fully unsupervised scenario is firstly from a scientific perspective. So um, trying to understand better how languages align or how we can map them together without any, um, any supervised data at all um, is perhaps similar to how humans um, learn languages or how um, a speaker might grow up bilingually. So it could teach us something about um, how different languages in the world relate to each other. Um, it can also be useful as a lab setting, as a competitive baseline, or in order to isolate the, um, the impact of monolingual data on our, our models. Um, and thirdly, on some settings, um, completely unsupervised approaches are actually very much competitive with their supervised counterparts, such as for cases where we are only dealing with mostly um, very similar languages. So in those cases and in very practical applications where you, if you want to prototype something quickly or if you actually care about having something that is simple or easy to use, um, unsupervised methods might actually be the preferred solution still. Um, so now going from the, the motivation here, I want to talk uh, now a bit more about what is actually the current state of the art in this area and what these um, approaches um, are learning or why, why they are working um, as well as uh, they are. Um, and here, just to give a bit, a bit of background um, in case we've been totally out of the loop with the recent uh, developments in the last few years, um, most, of the, uh, most of the approaches in um, multilingual learning are based on transformer models. In particular, they're based on variants of the BERT architecture. And um, BERT really is just a um, large transformer-based model that is pre-trained with um, mass language modeling. And the um, kind of most um, crucial aspect um, of BERT for kind of the remaining section here is that BERT's um, token level representations consist of three different parts. Um, in particular, we have for each word a, or for each subword, we have a token level embedding here, so token. Um, we have a position embedding um, that 
um, basically is a learned embedding um, that word uses to identify where the, um, where the word appears in the sentence. And we have a second embedding in case we want to model not uh, just one sentence, but pairs of sentences. Um, and then BERT consists of a stack of transformer layers um, and is trained, as I mentioned, using mass language modeling, where we randomly um, mask a fraction of the input words and then try to predict those words in the output. Um, and BERT is typically used in practice by, um, again, as I said before, fine tuning it on data of a task, like, again, natural language inference here, um, and then uh, evaluating it on the same task. Now, most of the approaches in multilingual uh, learning do basically the exact um, same thing, um, but just substitute the data in one language with the combined corpora um, of multiple languages. And the um, other common components here is that instead of having um, only one vocabulary that is restricted to one language, um, they use a joint subword vocabulary that assigns words or subwords that are spelled the same in different languages, the same ID, so the same embedding. Um, but then again, uh, you have the same setup as in training a bird model. So you can basically, if you just change the pre-trained data, you can train a monolingual bird also just uh, multilingually. Um, so we again have the pre-training phase. So in this case, just covering uh, multiple languages. Um, and again, as before, um, now for applying it to a tag task, we first feed in data in high resource language such as English, and then apply it via zero-shot transfer to another language such as um, Spanish here. Um, and people have been initially very, um, very surprised that this model, which really does not um, receive kind of any additional information about how these different languages relate to each other and how maybe the different words in the languages um, might um, align with words in the other language. This model really did um, surprisingly well on a number of diverse uh, tasks in natural language processing. And the reasons people um, initially tried to attribute for this um, surprisingly good behavior were um, a few. In particular, they um, suggested that part of the reason for the good performance is um, the fact that we have this shared subword vocabulary, where identically spelled subwords have the same embedding in different languages. Um, because in practice, for many similar languages or languages that at least share the same script, um, we often have um, kind of a large number of tokens that um, have similar meaning. Um, for instance, a lot of uh, named entities have the same spelling in different languages. We also have punctuation or numerals, which also generally have the same meaning in different languages. And so these people hypothesized could serve as anchors, uh, and the model then um, from these anchors would basically um, be able to figure out an lexical alignment, and then by being trained uh, jointly on those different languages, um, this alignment would um, kind of permeate to the other words and to the higher level representations, and that would then ultimately lead to learning um, kind of truly multilingual representations that go beyond just memorizing uh, the vocabulary or an alignment on the vocabulary. Um, and in recent work, however, we um, proposed a kind of a counterpoint approach um, that really seeks to demonstrate that um, we do not actually need um, any of these factors, um, any of these conditions for learning uh, multilingual representations. But in fact, we can do uh, we can reach a similar performance as these state-of-the-art models by um, learning the model, learning the languages sequentially, um, and by using um, disjoint vocabularies. And briefly, the approach um, that we kind of proposed here um, is very similar to um, the basically combination of the monolingual and the multilingual approach. And in this case, we just train a um, monolingual approach uh, so we just train a monolingual bird model first in our high resource language, um, just as you are used to. Um, and the, the main difference is now that instead of applying that or yeah, training it uh, jointly on different languages, uh, now in order to apply it to, uh, to a different language, um, we just um, we freeze all of the parameters from our English bird model. So all of the other, uh, all of most of the parameters of the model have still only been trained on English data. Uh, 
And the only thing that we learn from scratch for our new language are these token level representations. So just representations for um, that, uh, for the new subwords in uh, our new language, um, such as uh, Spanish in this context here. Um, and then at test time, again, we do the same thing as before. We fine tune this model now using um, our English uh, embeddings on English data of our target task. We fine tune the entire model, but just keep these cross lingual or the token level parameters fixed to maintain any sort of alignment that the model might have learned. Um, and at test time now, in order to do zero shot transfer to the other language, the only thing that we're doing is just to um, slot in uh, to substitute our uh, foreign language embeddings into, uh, into the model. And um, um, like this, uh, we perform our experiments. And I think that this approach, kind of if you are really convinced that the three factors that I outlined before um, really account for all of the success of these methods, you would basically have to say or argue that this approach should not work at all because firstly, um, it has completely disjoint vocabularies. So um, there's no actual information about which words might be spelled similarly or which mer uh, words might refer to the same uh, meaning in the different languages. And in addition, the high-level um, high representations that the model has learned uh, have only been trained on English as well. So if, you're, um, if you were kind of, a, of the opinion that um, we would actually require multilingual training to learn um, good general purpose multilingual representations, then this model also should not perform very well because most of its representations, except for the token level embeddings, have only been trained on English. Um, and just to give you um, kind of few, like a snapshot of the performance here, we evaluated that model on uh, four different um, diverse cross lingual tasks. And I'm only, for time's sake, only going to show here the performance on our, on the natural language uh, inference task here, um, where we can see that um, compared to the um, state of the art approach, um, where we compare it to um, kind of baseline jointly trained approaches, both for all languages and pairwise languages. Um, we can see that our approach here really achieves um, kind of the, the baseline approach achieves very similar performance. And in addition, if we add um, also learn um, position embeddings in the target language and add some additional noise in order to make the model more robust during fine tuning, we can almost completely recover the performance of our jointly trained methods. Um, so just to summarize briefly here, what this really shows, um, generally we've seen competitive performance for these jointly trained methods. And um, generally I think this really shows that you can do um, a lot just with um, superficial lexical alignment. And on the flip side, this really calls into question how much um, these current state of the art multilingual methods um, actually learn in practice. Um, and thirdly, um, I think an, uh, another interesting um, food for thought here is that monolingual representations uh, might capture surprisingly much about multilingual information. Um, and with regard to multilingual training, what actually is necessary is that, um, or what is not necessary is a shared subword vocabulary. Um, we also do not really need to train on multiple languages and the most important factor that we've identified was really the effective vocabulary size per language. So really trying to make sure that um, you have sufficient capacity and sufficient number of embeddings for the different words in your languages. Um, so now coming to the, the third part of the presentation. Um, the curse of multi multilinguality is basically another reason why um, train, having a multilingual model might hurt performance. In particular, this has been referred to as a trade-off between um, the capacity of your model and the number of languages you want to cover. Um, in particular, for in previous work, people have observed that if you um, have a multilingual model with a fixed capacity and you scale the number of languages the model is pre-trained on, the performance of the model um, suffers in general, the more languages you incorporate. Um, however, kind of in interestingly, perhaps um, there's a slight, um, slight uh, increase in performance initially for the low resource languages due to some amount of additional uh, positive transfer from similar high resource languages. Um, and generally, people have observed that if you add more capacity, um, this helps to some extent. But in the end, if we want to have a model that can cover um, all um, like as many languages as possible. We don't really want to have a 
billion parameter model um, that is very hard to use, um, particularly for low resource or low compute scenarios in practice. And state of the art models uh, at the moment strike this balance with about 100 languages that they cover in their pre-trained data. And, um, but broadly in this line of research, really I think the goal should be to bridge this gap for these large models, um, to bridge the gap between the performance on high resource and uh, low resource languages, which still, still amounts to more than 20% uh, uh, accuracy points here. And one approach, which I think is very, uh, very promising in this line of research, uh, uses, um, tries to allocate some additional um, capacity for um, the other languages. And in particular, one flexible method I think um, that we can allocate and use this additional capacity is to use what is known as resi uh, residual adapters, which are basically um, small bottleneck layers that are inserted between um, the pre-trained um, parameters of your, uh, of your model. Um, so to, just to demonstrate that a bit more, we have here um, our approach, which, uh, which basically uses um, different sorts of uh, adapters for cross-lingual transfer. Um, and here in the, on the right, we can see kind of a close-up um, close schematic of a transformer layer. And on the, right, on the left, we can see kind of the full stack of different transformer layers. And what we propose here is to insert these different bottleneck layers into the transformer layers in order to allow the model uh, additional capacity to learn useful information about the task and the languages. Um, for instance, we propose here um, to have uh, language adapters that can be trained um, separately with mass language modeling. Um, so generally for training um, all adapters here and in general, you typically would freeze um, all of the parameters of your model and only train the adapter um, parameters. Uh, so it's generally very uh, parameter efficient. And if you do multiple tasks, you can just reuse all of the parameters of your uh, frozen model. Um, so in this case, we use our uh, language adapters to capture additional, um, additional characteristics of our target language. Um, we use task adapters to learn um, idiosyncrasies or the special relationships in the task we're interested on doing task-specific fine-tuning. Um, and in addition, we also propose to use um, invertible adapters here to adapt to a, a mismatch in vocabulary. Because as we've seen before, um, it's really important to allocate additional capacity on the, um, on the vocabulary level. Um, however, we don't really want to, um, for each language that we try to, um, to tackle, um, create, have a large number of embeddings, which really make up the um, biggest part of the pr uh, parameter budget of our multilingual models. So instead we want to learn, um, we propose to learn additional token level transformations. And because the input and output embeddings are shared in these multilingual models, we can have um, inver invertible adapters um, that we can apply both at the input and at the output layer. Um, in general, what this means uh, then, or what I think is very nice about this sort of um, framework is that they really allow um, plug and play. So you can only need to train an adapter uh, once for each task in each language, and you can then apply them to any other um, setting that you're interested in. Um, and in the sake of time here, just to highlight um, kind of one, one particular evaluation setting from a number that we've been tackling. Um, here you can see the relative improvement of our, our method versus um, kind of the state-of-the-art multilingual method, uh, XLMR. Um, and in particular, we outperform using XLMR as the pre trained model. We outperform it on, in most settings. And you can see kind of the relative improvement here um, on the right. Um, where we always, uh, so now not only transfer from English to another language, but generally from all of the languages on the left to all of the languages on the bottom, where as we go higher to the right and to the bottom, the languages are either become either more low resource and the languages to the right are languages that actually the model has not seen at all during pre-training. So as I mentioned, the model was only trained on hundred languages. So all other languages of the world would be unseen to the pre-trained model. And what we can see here in particular is that the model performs um, particularly well on transfer from high resource to these low resource or unseen languages, which is really the setting that is most um, interesting and most realistic in practice. Um, we also generally see um, strong gains when transferring from Arabic, which might be due um, to the model not having um, allocated much capacity in its vocabulary to Arabic script. 
Um, in addition, we also see a strong performance across the di diagonal here on the low usage languages. So this so adapters can even help if you have label data in your language and you just want to evaluate um, on the same language. Um, and finally, kind of uh, broadly, we also see competitive performance in general. So um, very small gains or differences um, in transfer from or to high resource languages. Um, so general, I hope with those um, brief results, I convinced you or at least made an argument that adapters can be a useful transfer for a useful framework for cross-link transfer and can be particularly useful for uh, low resource languages. Um, and just because I'm running a bit short on time here, I'm going to try to cover the, the last part um, quite, quite quickly. Um, and as I mentioned um, before, or we've, I've, uh, we've seen before already that even state of the art methods such as um, this XLMR that I mentioned um, perform um, quite poorly on, um, particularly on low usage languages. And one particular explanation for that is that so far in crossing regulation, most of the data sets that people have been looking on have been focusing either on a small number of tasks and typically in uh, favorable conditions. So typically looking at mostly um, related um, high resource languages. And so far there's been really missing a large scale benchmark to evaluate it, um, to evaluate um, cross-lingual or state-of-the-art multilingual methods on a more representative set of tasks under a wide number of different uh, conditions and languages. And this is something that we've um, been, we've proposed um, recently, which we've referred to as uh, extreme, which is essentially a benchmark suite of tasks that covers four core categories of common tasks, natural language processing, uh, kind of roughly ordered from more simpler uh, tasks, such as sentence classification or structured or token level prediction to more complex tasks such as question answering. And um, for those tasks or after evaluating on those tasks, we then have get a combined score um, of performance on those tasks in the different languages that can be a measure of the cross-lingual generalization about the ability of our model. And we selected these tasks to generally be um, easy for humans, but tough for our current methods to solve, to, buy, to be diverse enough, so to require reasoning on um, different levels of meaning, such as on the syntactic or semantic level. Um, they should still be efficiently able to train so that practitioners can use them to evaluate on their um, preferred uh, low resource languages. Uh, and they should also cover as many languages as possible while being uh, accessible um, to use for everyone without any special license. Um, and the other aspect that was important in choosing the tasks was the, the languages. In particular, we did try to strike a balance between um, having sufficient amounts of monolingual data available for learning useful representations while um, uh, maximizing the coverage of different language families. And as you are in kind of in contrast to the um, initial motivation from before, in this benchmark, unfortunately, because we're restricted to using um, accessible uh, label data sets, we are still mostly focused on um, high resource or compare like still fairly um, medium resource languages. So it's still, this benchmark still doesn't, is not able to cover um, truly low resource languages where we don't have enough um, monolingual data available for training. Um, in total, we cover 14 languages from 14 different language families with also a different number of scripts. And for the evaluation, we focused on um, basically the setup that, is, that I described before on taking a pre-trained multilingual encoder, fine tuning that on uh, data in high resource language like English, and then evaluating that on data of different languages in a zero-shot fashion. And the advantage of that is um, with fine-tuning it on English that we only need to fine-tune the model once and can um, directly get the evaluation scores on all of the other languages that are available for the task. And the, the methods that we looked at here um, are, you've kind of, I've kind of mentioned before here, are basically transformer-based methods, uh, in particular the XLMR approach that I mentioned before, and a couple of baseline methods that look at the feasibility of using translation for rather than having cross-lingual supervision and how well we can do with that. Um, but here, for um, just for the sake of time, I'm mainly going to give a brief snapshot um, of the performance of the best performing model, XLMR, um, across the different tasks. Um, and here, there might be a lot of different uh, data points here. So this is just an overview across all of the tasks. Um, 
the performance of XMR um, for each task with its task specific metric in for all of the task languages. Um, and in particular, you can see at the top, the red star is the human performance and below that typically the golden cross is the performance in English. And what we can generally see is that for the simpler tasks, the performance in English is very close to human performance, um, whereas the gap is larger for um, the more challenging data sets. Um, secondly, we can also see that there is generally a substantial gap between the performance on English and the performance on um, some of the other languages. Um, and um, kind of another interesting finding is that the scores for the simpler tasks, in particular for the sentence classification tasks, which have been mainly been the ones that uh, have been used in previous work, are concentrated in a very small range. So based on these scores, it's really not really not able to tell very well how, how well the model truly generalized those, uh, to those languages. Uh, whereas we see a much wider spread and a much um, stronger difference in performance for some of these more difficult tasks. And in particular, somewhat surprisingly to us, um, uh, because these um, ta like token level tasks, like part of speech checking named entity recognition, as we've seen before in a monolingual setting are very close to being solved. However, if you um, expect your model to zero shot transfer um, without any additional supervision, um, these models actually very much um, still struggle with um, transferring this uh, structural information, um, but even for these uh, comparatively easy tasks. Um, and lastly, um, if we break down the performance across different language families, um, perhaps unexpectedly, we find that the performance is generally the best on the more high resource Indo-European languages. And we generally see um, low performance on either low resource language families or on language families which have different scripts. Um, so as I mentioned before, really for current methods, um, having tokens that are underrepresented in the vocabulary or even being able to tokenize appropriately languages with different scripts is very much still a big challenge in research. Um, and lastly, here for extreme, if I uh, the presentation here has whet your appetite. Um, the leaderboard is available and ready for submission. In fact, we've had already the first um, new state-of-the-art approaches on uh, this data set. Um, we've provided a number of scripts for practitioners to use to fine-tune uh, their models on or pre-trained methods in general on this task, which are based on the uh, popular Hagen Face Transformers library. Um, and basically allow you to fine tune models very easily with a few uh, lines of code. And in general, we've also, in order to incentivize more research in using additional data, or really evaluating on these slow resource languages, we've also open sourced um, automatic translations that can be used for analyses for most of our data sets. Um, so with that, I just want to conclude with a couple of high-level takeaways. In particular, I think you should be uh, try to be rigorous how you motivate your approach in this line of research and try to be explicit about what kind of signals, both monolingual and cross-lingual, you're using in your approach. Um, as I mentioned before, shared vocabulary is not actually necessary and monolingual representations transfer perhaps unexpectedly well. Um, Adapters are, in my opinion, um, quite a flexible way to tackle this curse of multilinguality. Um, and cross-lingual transfer learning in general poses many interesting challenges, among which I think uh, transfer to low research languages and to these um, more structural token level tasks are the most interesting ones. Um, and finally, Extreme can provide a, a window into models cross-lingual generalization performance and the resources are available under those things. Um, so with that, here are just for completeness um, the references for the papers I mentioned throughout the talk. And uh, with that, I just want to uh, say thank you um, also to my uh, collaborators and thanks to you all for your attention. Thank you so much, Sebastian. Fantastic talk. Uh, okay, so we're going to enter the QA. Uh, I see we already have a few questions in the QA. If anyone has any questions, uh, please now is the time to uh, add them into the QA um, and we'll either ask the questions for you or if you want to ask them yourself then um, raise your hand um, using the raise hand button and uh, we're going to unmute you and you can ask your question yourself um, and we can get some discussion going. Um, I'm going to be, I just want to introduce you also to Danny and Giuseppe who are also from Evolution AI who are going to be helping on the uh, discussion. Um, so yes, yeah, so let's um, Let's go to the first question. So, so 
I uh, can see here. Um, we have a question from Haida um, Iqbal. Haida, raise your hand if you want to. If you want to ask your question yourself. Uh, also, I should say that if you want to, um, if you want to chat to the um, to, to to us to the organisers, then you can just use the chat, and it's only going to be seen by us. It's not going to be publicly visible. Um, okay, so we don't. I can't see any raised hands, so I'm going to ask uh, Heide's question myself. Um, can multilingual BERT models work for languages from Arabic origins? Uh, actually, I have another question which is quite close to this from Zaid, which is. Do rich morphological languages like Arabic cause problems in multilingual training? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so for, um, I mean, yeah, as, as I hoped, I was able to at least answer a bit with the like, second part of the talk. Um, so multilingual bird covers some Arabic languages, like definitely Arabic and I think a couple of other languages with Arabic script in its pre-trained data. So for those languages, the model might do um, reasonably um, reasonably well in terms of transfer. Um, however, as I mentioned, um, generally because most of the languages in the pre-trained data have um, are like um, have Latin script or are more languages with different scripts are generally underrepresented in the data, um, the model might not, yeah, it's not going to do as well as on um, some of these Indo-European languages. Um, yeah, so for, particularly for uh, languages with different scripts, I think something like using kind of adapters or additional parameters to better adapt to those vocabularies can be very useful. Um, maybe, maybe just to follow from that, Sebastian, you, you, you one of the points that you made was that your methods don't seem to be, um, they don't seem to care whether there are any subwords in common between the languages that you're trying to transfer from. How, how do you reconcile that with, you know, the, the, this, these kind of issues that, that, that the transfer from Arabic is different, difficult to multilingual deep learning models, and also evidence in the literature that, that um, you know, things like multilingual BERT don't work as well when languages don't have subwords in common. Um, how, how, is, it, is it just that your method is just fundamentally different, so it doesn't care, or, or, or do you think something else is going on? Um, so I think, I mean, one, one fundamental issue is that the, um, like the main um, tokenization methods that are currently used in these state-of-the-art methods um, rely on subword tokenization, and a lot of these, um, a lot of the current algorithms for subword tokenization are not that well suited for um, either morphologically rich languages or also languages which perhaps um, are not white space segmented or just have yeah, different symbols or different types of scripts. Um, so I think this, um, this kind of require, like reliance really already um, yeah, biases these models or makes it um, easier for these models to perform well on languages where these algorithms have just been um, designed for or with those they have been designed with in mind. Um, and then for the, yeah, for Arabic script, I think, or just generally for dealing with different scripts, I think it's really an issue that um, in the, in the pre-trained data or the way the um, vocabulary is constructed really is based on just how much data is available or how often these different uh, tokens are seen in, in the vocabulary. Um, so that really um, also favors um, high resource languages. Um, and then to the second part of your question, I think it's yeah it's, it's still not that well, or I still don't have a fully um, like silver bullet explanation for how these methods actually like learn this underlying um, cross lingual alignment. Because at least the explanation based on having um, shared subwords kind of makes sense perhaps intuitively. Um, but as maybe the the method that we that I mentioned here, um, this monolingual transfer method that I highlighted. Um, indicates is that the model in, in some way um, is able to, like just through the, the pre-training, is able to, um, and by optimizing the task language specific score, is able to yeah, find an alignment in an unsupervised way still like on the, on the lexical level, uh, essentially between the different languages. Um, but how, yeah, how that exactly uh, comes, happens, or how that develops over time is still, yeah, still very much an active research area. Great, thank you. Um, so Sebastian, if you click on the QA button at the bottom, you're going to be able to see the, the questions, which so I can see there's loads of questions now. So uh, okay. if you want to select something, 
um, you could, I think if you stop sharing your screen, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes. Right at the bottom is Q and A. It's yeah, okay, now I can see what's going on. So there's a bunch of questions, so uh, go ahead and uh, see if anything strikes your fancy. Otherwise, we can just select something. Cool, okay, and we've dealt, okay. So, and those are, sorry, just in order of, okay. Uh, then let's go chronologically here. So how beneficial transferring would be in cases where we don't have enough uh, cross-lingual data. Um, so, yeah, I think the, I mean, the, cro yeah, the cro cross-lingual, um, I mean, as I kind of mentioned um, in general here, um, the, the methods I've spent most of the talk talking about, these large um, unsupervised like multilingual pretrained transformer methods do not actually re rely that much on having cross-lingual data, right? They just, they are just trained on large amounts of um, monolingual data. Um, but um, yeah, due to the, the caveat or the actual, the, uh, limit of um, having monolingual data available. Um, at the moment, they're mostly limited to languages where, where we have sufficient amounts of Wikipedia data or um, sufficient data on the web. So um, I think it's still, um, yeah, so I think it's a very interesting direction to figure out how we can perhaps bootstrap our representations or leverage this additional supervision that I um, outlined to scale these methods um, beyond the languages um, where we have monolingual data available. Or training good representations. Um, um, Sebastian, just to let you know, some of these questions actually were came up during your talk, so some right, of them. Yeah, you know, so really answered, answered uh, some of them, maybe. Yeah. Uh, uh, this, uh, this this looks quite interesting from Anna. Um, do you have, do you want to put your hand? Does anyone want to ask their questions themselves? You can put your hand up, and we're going to unmute you. Otherwise, we can just uh, ask it ourselves. Okay. Um, so Anna's asking, can similar techniques be applied to extract knowledge representation from formal languages, applications being code optimization? Uh, that's an in interesting question. So, I mean, these are the types of methods that I, um, that I kind of outlined here have mostly been, like, they mainly focus on learning these multilingual representations. Um, but a very related area of research is, um, or well, the area of research that, that builds upon is learning these um, cross lingual representations on the word level, which generally try to figure out an alignment um, between different words in different languages. Um, and the other thing that is very related is unsupervised machine translation, which basically also tries to figure out an alignment between different languages, but now between the sentences or translations on the sentence level between different languages. And both of those other two factors um, can actually be applied, like are not really limited to um, just natural text. Um, so in fact, I think um, there's been a recent work from Facebook, which basically did unsupervised um, code translation. Um, so where they just took uh, mono or um, data uh, code samples um, from GitHub in different uh, code languages. Um, such as Python and Java, for instance, and then had a basically exactly the same algorithm try to discover in an unsupervised way an alignment between um, <coughs> the co uh, code patterns in the different languages. And the resulting model was actually given kind of an input of a function in Python, which was able to translate to, uh, it with some reasonable degree of accuracy to uh, another coding language. Um, yeah, so I, I would assume the same if you can just, if you have as long, I think, as you have um, a large enough corpus of your formal language, um, you could probably apply um, the same methods to that and try to see if, it can, if they can discover such an alignment as well. How about cross-modal applications, things like speech and uh, text? Um, yeah, for cross-modal, so yeah, as well, like, Cross-modal, multimodal um, modeling is a very, I guess, quite an active area of research where similar models that are based on transformers or even just cross-modal variants of BERT have been applied. And in some cases, and generally these methods differ based on the supervision they get. So for some of those cases, um, they um, get access to both the text um, and the corresponding image, such as for image captions, for instance. Uh, but in some other cases, the models have also been trained on uh, kind of separate image data and separate text data and have um, uh, at least on like multimodal tasks been, um, been observed to learn surprisingly well um, representations in those cases. 
So can, could you could you do things like zero shot learning and um, for question answering and, and things like this? So you, you train in uh, in language, and then uh, you can actually do, you, you can actually use uh, images to do some question answering. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think you can you can do that. I think the, like these methods still. I think, as far as I'm aware, still struggle with some uh, like once you get into more complex reasoning or if you ask more um, like complex questions uh, of a model that they might not um, might not really have seen before. Um, but for asking kind of standard or general like visual question like visual question answering questions, um, they are doing pretty well. Amazing. Uh, here's a here's a good question um, from Zaid. Um, from your experience, is it possible to get rid of the tokenization process and train on the raw corpus, like CNN models? Um, so CNN. Um, I guess the idea is like, don't could you do this directly from uh, symbols, like from characters, rather than tokenizing? Yeah. So I guess I mean yeah, CNN models, at least for NLP, typically also um, still require tokenization, typically before. Um, and so yeah one one thing that you do potentially is um is kind of a compromise between uh, looking at the raw corpus is to um treat the corpus as consisting of a sequence of characters uh in which case people also um yeah typically still assumed kind of a white space separation um and traditionally or at least with um deep neural networks character based methods have been Kind of seen to underperform their word level or their subword level counterparts um, generally. Um, there's some hybrid methods which also leverage word based um, word based representations um, or that kind of look at uh, larger sequences of characters which are doing quite well. Um, and I actually haven't seen much work that really um, even goes beyond characters and just looks at the raw sequence of bytes. Um, um, there's been some work on like monolingual processing, but not that much with recent methods. So I think that's that's quite an interesting area. Um, because yeah, as I mentioned, I think tokenization is one of the biggest issues for these current methods. And if we can figure out a way um, to learn this um, in a way that is independent or doesn't really have any assumptions about the underlying script, I think that would be very powerful. Okay, so we have a question. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, I'm sorry, but I, th I think maybe Michele. Um, do you get better results with transfer learning when you stay within language families? E, uh, for example, Korean for a model trained on Sino-Tibetan languages versus transfer from a model trained on English. Um, yeah, yeah, co completely. So um, I think one, like a general trend or like a general best practice is if you have high resource or data in a high resource language that is similar to your target language, um, you basically always, almost always get better performance than if you transfer from like an arbitrary language. And that's kind of one of the limitations of this large, um, the last benchmark that I mentioned of extreme, because in that case, um, basically because for most of the data sets um, that are cross-lingual or that people have proposed in recent years, the training data is only uh, available in English. Um, so because of that, we decided to use English as the source language. Um, but in practice, depending on your application, you might actually be better off on choosing a different um, languages to, to transfer from. So how about examples like Quechua, when um, you know, most speakers of Quechua are also Spanish speakers, there's a lot of borrowed words between the two languages and you, 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 know, you have a lot of transfer. Um, does that, has anyone looked at whether these kind of languages have, have uh, different characteristics? Um, yeah, so I mean, I'm not sure about that particular language pair, but for um, kind of low research languages and similar high research languages, there's been a number of studies um, looking at transfer for different tasks. And generally, I think it, yeah, it often correlates just with um, linguistic similarities. So if they're in the same language family, that is kind of a good criterion already. Um, but there's been some studies which basically looked at like other factors and um, it often also depends just on the availability of data in your task. So if you have um, enough uh, pre-trained data available, sometimes even transferring from a, from a perhaps more distant language might actually give you better performance. So I wanted to ask you about XNLI, um, one of the uh, evaluation methods that you, that you spoke about. Um, so, 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 you know, at least kind of um, in, these kind of um, natural language inference data sets have obviously been criticized a lot in the literature um, because of the um, 
the idea that they're, they're impacted by a lot of artifact, artifacts due to the annotation process. So for like, um, like the hypotheses for the, like the negative entailment or negative hypotheses often have like the word not in them or lots of negative words. Um, so the idea is that you could just you can just look at the hypotheses themselves without having to look at the premise and you can you can you can kind of um, guess the answer. Um, and there are lots of methods of just exploiting these kind of um, artifacts. So I mean, I mean, how do you how can you make sure that what you're looking at is really not just an artifact or, and, and is really is really you're you're really evaluating some deeper understanding of language. Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, yeah, I think in general that's a very very tough question. Uh, I think something the whole field of NLP is like struggling or trying to grapple with. Um, and I personally think that a good way, or at least a way to get closer to, or to get a more objective um, measure of the model's performance, is to evaluate it on kind of a diverse set of tasks. Um, so not just looking at yeah one task such as X and I to look at a wide range of tasks that are maybe um, that are perhaps more complex, and in particular looking at settings that really um, that really try to test limitations of the model that either. Um, can encompass a domain shift, so maybe data from a slightly different distribution or from a, um, a different language that a model hasn't seen before. Um, and I think in, in multilingual modeling, there's also, or for multilingual data sets in general, there's also another um, bias, which is related to the, um, the way those data sets have been generated. Um, because most multilingual data sets, um, given that they are, so XMI similarly to, um, because XMI was created from the uh, multi MI English data set by translating um, portions of the test data from it to other languages. And particular data sets that are created through this translation process um, also have some additional artifacts in that translation, uh, kind of even using human translations, does not really um, produce exactly natural language. Um, in that translation also has its own artifacts, uh, which are have some subtle differences compared to uh, human languages. And for instance, for these XMI or data sets created through translation, we've observed that methods that actually uh, are trained on machine translation, translated data do actually uh, a lot better on them, just because they um, kind of get some of these additional biases about what a translation should look like. Mm -hmm. Great, so we're out of time. Thanks so much, Sebastian. Really fantastic talk, and thanks for answering, answering so many questions for us. Thanks for having me, and yeah, all, all the best, everyone, and thanks for, thanks for listening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.